The following program is sponsored by CBN. Coming up, they're trying to undermine the president. People who didn't support him when he ran didn't vote for him on election day. While working inside the White House. The facts are very simple. And they have allies throughout the government. They went after American citizens for political purposes, and it should never happen again. Plus, spend the holidays with a civil rights hero. Martin Luther King Jr.'s niece takes us inside the legend's home on today's 700 Club. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. You know, it's interesting, this stuff about climate change, everybody thinks is a terrible thing. A big report has come out by our government that says uh, climate change by 2020 is going to be alarming. And the French decided they were going to do something about climate change. They were going to impose a major tax on gasoline, and uh, that was going to help climate change. Well, it turned out the people of France didn't like it. They rioted. They set fire out in Paris. They started chipping on the Arc de Triomphe. And so President Macron says, hey, maybe we're not going to bear that cost after all. And so the, he's backed off of that tax, and Terry has more. Well, that tax did lead to increased rioting in Paris, and as Gary Lane reports, President Trump recognized the economic threat of climate change policies very early on. Take a look. At the climate summit in Poland, the U.N. Secretary General urged world leaders to take the threat of climate change seriously. He said bold action is needed if nations are to prevent a catastrophic rise in temperatures before the end of the century. But recent events in France might signal a growing backlash against climate change policies. If we fail, the Arctic and the Antarctic will continue to melt. Corals will bleach and then die. The oceans will rise. More people will die from air pollution. Water scarcity will plague a significant proportion of humanity. And the cost of disasters will skyrocket. Guterres said nations are not moving fast enough to prevent irreversible catastrophe. But tell that to these anti-government protesters in Paris. They crippled the City of Light, rioting, looting, and even defacing parts of the famous Arc de Triomphe. It was all over a steep tax increase on gasoline. The French government believes it can combat climate change by raising fuel taxes, and that may lead to reduced carbon emissions. But instead, just the threat of an increase led to national fury and mayhem. French President Macron has backed off from implementing the fuel tax increase for now. Their pocketbooks already strained by economic hardship, the skeptical French aren't buying the climate change hysteria. Neither is President Trump. Tweeting this week, I am glad that my friend Emmanuel Macron and the protesters in Paris have agreed with the conclusion I reached two years ago. The Paris Agreement is fatally flawed because it raises the price of energy for responsible countries while whitewashing some of the worst polluters. Last year, the president announced he's pulling the U.S. out of the Paris Climate Agreement because it would cripple the U.S. economy. Thus, as of today, the United States will cease all implementation of the non-binding Paris Accord. Trump says he won't allow American workers and taxpayers to absorb the costs of those accords in terms of lost jobs, lower wages, and closed factories. Stephen Moore, economist and senior fellow at the Heritage Foundation, says a doom and gloom lobby is pushing the climate change agenda in America and around the world. I estimate that the climate change industrial complex, and that's what we have today, is tens and tens of billions of dollars to spread this doom and gloom. We've created whole industries of, of climate scientists to come up with these, uh, with these models that predict the world is coming to an end. Gary Lane, CBN News. Thanks, Gary. Ladies and gentlemen, like it or not, uh, climate, I mean, obviously we don't want to pollute the air. We want clean water. Uh, we'd be crazy not to want it. We don't want our, our rivers polluted. I was in Poland, and, and the, I think it was the Vistula River that was so polluted, you, 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 couldn't, you could hardly stand the smell, and there were no fish that could live in it. So we can't have anything like that. And uh, I was in Prague, talked to uh, 
our ambassador there, Shirley Temple Black, by the way, our ambassador, and she said, you breathe the air, it's like smoking a pack of cigarettes a day because the air is so polluted in Prague. So we, we don't want that kind of thing. But the truth is that this climate religion is an attempt to take over the industry and to cripple the productive industries of the world. And the great polluters are India and China, and they're having a pass. But beyond that, it looks like that they say that the sunspot activity out of the sun uh, is diminished, and that means we're going to have a lot colder weather because, not because of anything to do with what we do with our SUVs and our driving or what we burn in our fossil fuels. It has to do with the sun. And according to Joe Bastardi, our expert from AccuWeather, we're going to have a really cold winter. So let's see what's going to happen. A nasty winter storm is moving across our country despite so-called global warming. Ephraim Graham has that. Pat, forecasters are predicting what could be a coast-to-coast -coast winter weather event, bringing extremely cold temperatures, snow, and ice. Meteorologists are predicting the storm system, which will move all the way from the southwest to the mid-Atlantic, could affect millions of people. There could be flooding, ice, snow, and rain, bringing power outages and making life miserable from one side of the nation to the other, with at least a dozen states getting snow and another 20 getting rain. If that storm hits Washington, D.C., it could delay important work in Congress. Lawmakers have just a few weeks to pass a major criminal justice reform bill. As Abigail Robertson reports, one veteran senator says they should clear the schedule to make sure the bill gets a vote. Lawmakers say the time is now or never to pass a criminal justice reform bill that's sitting in the Senate waiting on a vote. It's major legislation with the goal of trying to make sure people don't end up back in prison. Leader McConnell has said that he does not know if he will have time to bring it to the floor by the end of this year. What is your response to that? My response to it is that he has a very legitimate reason that he wants to get judges through. We can work on judges next year because Republicans control the Senate. Whereas if we don't do this bill and Democrats control, come in and control the House, we're not going to get the broad bipartisan support that we have for this. The bill has already passed the House and Grassley believes more than 75 senators would vote yes if it makes it to the Senate floor. He worries if it's delayed until next year, it's over. Lawmakers have a lot to do before the end of the year, including paying for border security. Grassley is confident lawmakers can avoid a partial government shutdown simply because he says it costs a lot of money to open and close the government. I don't think with a fiscal s uh, situation in our country, we should do anything as stupid as shutting down the government. A few senators like James Langford are working to permanently remove the threat of these shutdowns. When you're constantly fighting about a government shutdown, uh, then you're always distracted over what the real issues are. Langford introduced a bill that would require the previous year's funding to kick in until Congress passes a budget and only punishes lawmakers for missing their deadline. Congress has to be able to stay here and be able to get its work done uh, rather than it's not done. So we do these government shutdown fights or extensions and the American people go through all the turmoil. Let's put the pressure where the pressure needs to be. Congress has until December 21st to fund the rest of the government. Reporting from Capitol Hill, Abigail Robertson, CBN News. With or without a storm, the clock is ticking on this one, Pat. I tell you, a shutdown would be insanity. I mean, it would be insanity. And it, it will kick back on the president if he's the one that's caused it. Who, whoever caused it, he's going to take responsibility. And so he should do everything he can to fight it. But as far as this prison reform, I don't understand that much about it. There are people who don't like certain parts of it. But I, I think this idea of three strikes and you're out and the so-called it was tough on crime a wave that spread through our country a few years ago. That's got to be ameliorated. I mean, you know, if you get caught with a few ounces of marijuana and three times and you, you're going to spend the rest of your life in prison, that's insanity. And judges have got to have some f freedom. And it breaks their hearts that they, these mandatory minimums 
somebody comes up and they, they've done little or nothing, it's, it's a very victimless crime, and those people have got to spend forever in jail. Well, that, that costs an awful lot of money, and, and not only money, but human uh, tragedy, and it it's, it's needs to be fixed. And so uh, Senator Grassley is absolutely right. The bill's been passed to the House. The Senate has the majority right now. All they've got to do is have a vote and get it through. And I don't know, I mean, the agenda is such that they wouldn't have to debate that a long time because, uh, you know, Mitch McConnell is such a genius in, in uh, legislative matters, he can get it through. And of course, they've got to get some judges approved, but as he said, we've still got the majority and, and the Senate will have actually more uh, Republicans in the next uh, uh, session than they do now. And uh, there's no reason they can't get these things through. Um, Senator Flake has said, unless I get some uh, assurance about the Mueller investigation, but that thing is wrapping, uh, wrapping up, and uh, his objection uh, should not be considered. Well, anyhow, uh, it's going on Christmas time, <laughs> and uh, Ephraim's got, there's another major issue before Congress, Ephraim. Indeed, Pat, there is another major issue before Congress, and that's funding for the president's border wall. Right now, active duty troops are guarding the southwestern border, and Defense Secretary Jim Mattis is extending their deployment into the new year. It was supposed to end mid-December. The troops are there to help deal with migrant caravans making their way toward the United States. The president initially ordered about 5,800 troops to the southern border of Texas, Arizona, and California. That was back in October. Our Faith Nation program correspondent Chuck Holton said the military has changed its role since a large group of migrants tried to rush the border two weeks ago. Now there are several military police companies that are in actively engaged in training for riot control techniques. That is to be able to shore up the border patrol forces that are along that border and trying to make sure that those large groups of migrants are not able to just crash the border and come in. Those troops will remain on the border until at least January 31st. George H.W. Bush will be laid to rest at his presidential library today. A final service will be held in Houston before his coffin is taken to the Texas A&M campus in College Station. Thursday, presidents, world leaders and friends join the Bush family to celebrate his life at the National Cathedral. As White House correspondent Ben Kennedy shows us, it was a time of laughter, tears, prayer and praise. From the Capitol Hill steps to the halls of the National Cathedral and beyond. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. The country honored the nation's 41st president, George Herbert Walker Bush. George W. Bush delivered the eulogy for his father, the last person he spoke to before passing away. I said, Dad, I love you and you've been a wonderful father. And the last words he would ever say on earth were, I love you too. Seated in the front row alongside the Bush family was President Trump and First Lady Melania Trump, along with former Presidents Barack Obama, Bill Clinton, and Jimmy Carter. Christian recording artist Michael W. Smith, a longtime friend of the Bush family, sang Friends. Though it's hard to let you go in the Father's hands. It means something because I've been friends with him for 29 years. And so the fact that he wanted me to sing in his funeral, uh, it's, just, it's just an honor beyond words, it really is. Smith recalled seeing President Bush a mere months before he passed away. As we were leaving, we just gave him hugs and said, hey, we love you, we love you. Thanks, just so good to see you. And then all, and about the time we were back, he, oh, he, he kind of get his little finger in the air and he had that little sparkle in his eye. He said, Friends are friends forever. That's what he said. That's the last thing he said to us. And now you're singing friends. It's crazy. And Deb and I walked out of there thinking, you know what? That might be the last time that we see him. Reverend Dr. Russell Levinson was with the former president in his final days and shared a moment he witnessed between Bush and his former Secretary of State, James Baker, a man he called his little brother. Secretary Baker was at the foot of the president's bed. And toward the end, Jim Baker rubbed and stroked the president's feet for perhaps half an hour. 
The President smiled at the comfort of his dear friend. Here I witnessed a world leader who was serving a servant who had been our world's leader. And what came to mind was Jesus. The 94-year-old served his country as president, vice president, World War II veteran, and even CIA director. He guided the U.S. through the Gulf War and the breakup of the Soviet Union. He stood in the breach against tyranny and discrimination. And on his watch, a wall fell in Berlin. A dictator's aggression did not stand. But one of his proudest moments was that of a husband and a father. Married more than seven decades to Barbara, their marriage would bring six children, including George, who followed in dad's footsteps as the country's 43rd president. A great and noble man, the best father a son or daughter could have. And in our grief, let us smile knowing that dad is hugging Robin and holding mom's hand again. Now, former President Bush is only the 19th person to be honored with a state funeral. His casket is in Houston, Texas for a service, and he will be buried next to his wife, Barbara, and his daughter, Robin, who died at just three years old. Ben Kennedy, CBN News, the White House. Great man and a great family as well. Pat? Well, he was a good friend, and uh, I, I received many letters from him, and he came and visited us. We was on the show at 700 Club on a couple of occasions, and um, he's a good guy, and uh, uh, we, we were good friends. We, I traveled with him over to the Sudan when Numeri was president. Uh, I was on the, he was vice president then, and uh, it, it was nice to see him. We talked about the Lord on Air Force Two on the way. He wanted to find out about Jesus. He was interested in the things of God. Yeah, well, he was a man of character and dignity. He'll uh, be missed. W wonderful guy. Well, anyhow, uh, he's laid to rest and with the honors befitting uh, a person of his character and uh, the, the we're enriched by the his life and and uh, his memory i think is going to serve to unite us i hope it does but uh, we have something now that uh, tells about the division in our country and why it's a serious matter terry well, coming up inside the deep state, hear how President Trump's enemies are working to undermine him from inside the White House. Well, we talked about the nation coming together to honor uh, our 41st president, but uh, President Trump, our current president, has got many enemies, and the worst of them may be inside his own administration. CBN News spoke with two of the men of the main players behind the 2016 win, and they say the quote, deep state is working very hard to thwart the president's agenda. Our Jenna Browder has this story from Washington. In their new tell-all book, Trump's Enemies, How the Deep State is Undermining the Presidency, former campaign managers Corey Lewandowski and David Bossie reveal a lot, including a list of names of those they say have tried to undermine the president, some of them from inside the White House. Well, the November 9th clubber is comprised of people who didn't support him when he ran, didn't vote for him on Election Day, but found a way to weasel their way into the administration. And look, every president has to take people who weren't with him before to grow his team. The difference is, traditionally, those people put their personal biases aside and they work on behalf of the president to further his agenda. Sean Spicer, Gary Cohn, and H.R. McMaster are just a few they write about, but their list extends well beyond 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. Democrats, the intelligence community, media, and establishment are also included. There are people out there who, who say this whole idea of the deep state is a conspiracy. What do you say <laughs> to those people? Yeah, you know what, it's, that's the narrative that the left wants you to believe. The facts are very simple. Uh, there, and everybody knows it, you just have to think about how we are framing it, which is, there are people in the federal government who have been in it 
for 30 or 40 years. They have what we call the we own, you rent mentality. The president is only here for four years or eight years. They're here for 30 or 40. They slow walk your agenda. And when it comes to the Russia investigation. We detail it very much in the book and people should be very afraid because what the president outlines in his interview and what we talk about in the book, individuals at the highest level of law enforcement use their badges which they were entrusted with and they went after American citizens for political purposes and it should never happen again. There's talk that the president may pardon Paul Manafort. Do you think he should? Look, I think every president has it under their purview to issue pardons. Barack Obama issued more pardons than 13 previous presidents combined and some really bad guys. Um, you know, people who were convicted killers. But what I think the president said recently was he's not going to take that off the table. Then they say that's part of Trump's art of the deal mindset. They both know well. I mean, we were on Air Force One and you were both there. This was down to a campaign event in, in Florida. Um, but you're you're right there. You are in a lot of these conversations. Just tell us about your relationship that you still have with the president. Well, we have a great relationship. And part of the reason we wrote this book is so that we can bring to light the frustration that the president has faced, whether it's from the intelligence community, some of the mainstream media, some of his own staff, those people in Congress who's, who's thwarted his agenda, because we hear it, because we travel with him, we see it, and he deserves better. Another reason they say they wrote the book is to tout the president's successes and show the ways of Washington and what he's up against come 2020. In Washington, Jenna Browder, CBN News. Well, the book is called Trump's Enemies, How the Deep State is Undermining the Presidency, and you can get it wherever books are sold. Interesting stuff. Fascinating. Yeah. I'm sure you'll be reading it. <laughs> well, I, I think, uh, you know, you've got Clapper, and you've got Brennan, you've got these people. Uh, they're just openly antagonistic, and these so-called intelligence people, I think what's happening in the Justice Department, I, I, I think... Uh, when, when you look at what was done to set up this whole thing with a special prosecutor, that was engineered by the, uh, the Justice Department that, you know, and the FBI that really hated, they hated Trump. And you, you've got the emails back and forth between Schrock and his uh, girlfriend uh, that uh, said, how can we stop him? How can we use the power of the FBI to stop this man from being elected president? That kind of stuff was... was I mean, it's not something you need a book about. It was out there, and it's been out there in the public. And it, it was shocking. We should be shocked. These people should be prosecuted because they're misusing their power. You know, you, we give an enormous amount of power to the FBI, an enormous amount of power to our, our uh, federal prosecutors. And for them to misuse that power is something that, that sh should be uh, appalling and abhorrent to any uh, liberty-loving American. Terry. Well, up next, we're going to join a famous Gigi in our kitchen. Gorgeous Grandma Elvita King is cooking up a holiday feast that's fit for the seven generations of the King Williams clan. The self-confessed shaken poor chef will also share her kitchen blessings. All coming up when we come back. She is an author, an actress, a songwriter, and a singer with a new CD out called Tender Moments with God. Civil rights activist and evangelist Alveda King is a woman who's known for her many gifts, including her talent as an amazing cook. Take a look. Alveda King is the niece of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and the daughter of Reverend A.D. King. Alveda's family carries on the holiday traditions of her grandparents, Reverend Martin Luther King Sr. and Alberta Williams. The Williams King family celebrates by singing around the piano, posing for caricature drawings of the family, and of course, eating food, food, and more food. But most importantly, it all centers around the gift of Jesus Christ. In her cookbook, Gigi's Home for the Holidays, Alveda shares her family's delicious holiday recipes that bring laughter, love, and joy to their holiday table. 
Well, she's brought all her food with her. Welcome back to the 700 Club, Alvita King, also known as Gigi. Wonderful My Gigi name. also. Yeah. You're Gigi yeah. too. I'm Gigi too. <laughs> Wonderful. Yeah. We're sharing that name, right? Yes. Well, I want, I want you to share a little bit about your family's holiday and paint the picture for us. How many of you actually get together? Every year, there's so many of us, and we begin during Thanksgiving even. Wow. And so my own family, there are six living children, 10 grandchildren, the cousins, wow. and friends. So the house could have as many as, uh, fifth, as few as 15 wow. and as many as 35. Wow. Mm -hmm. And all of these people gathering together in such a, a wonderful atmosphere, because cooking in the kitchen is one of your your best kiss Christmas blessings that you talk about that exist in your family, but share some of the other favorites with you because you kind of all participate well, in all of this. Well, we do musically. Many of us are musical. We all pray, and that's the most important part. And then many of us are cooks from the adults down to the little children. Really? And uh, we're going to do a favorite in a minute. The Cornish hens, we'll talk about those. And then one of our new, dis new, new dishes. But uh, in our family with the Cornish hens, Everybody has their own recipe. So, oh, really? Yeah, we do. Some people stuff it with the apples, the oranges, the raisins, or whatever. Wow. And so it's just a tradition to see who does the best Cornish hen. What's your favorite tradition? Because you have so many that... My favorite tradition is to get together, to do the fellowship, to sing and to pray mm -hmm. together, play games together, and then everybody brings the covered dish, and we talk about how they made it. And we do that from Thanksgiving all the way through Christmas. Wow. Wow. Well, you're going to talk about your Christmas meal, the big meal yeah. here today with all of us. Let's move down here and start with the Cornish hens because they are such a fun way to celebrate a special event. They're they, beautiful. They really are. And I know you do that in your family, too. I do. Too. I love it. And Cornish hens are one of the easier dishes to do, but they're very festive. And we have here garnished with the kale and the cranberries. And this one is done with a rice stuffing. Mm -hmm. But as I say, you can use the, uh, the citrus. You can use the apples. You can even stuff with the cranberries. They have to be golden brown. And let me give you one tip on how I do that. Uh -huh. After we do all the seasonings over it, spray it with a light olive oil. Uh -huh. And when they roast, you get that beautiful color. And the fragrance mm -hmm. in your home so wonderful Absolutely. when they're baking, isn't it? This is a gorgeous salad. And people are so into doing something healthy and nutritious. In fact, everything we're showing here is really pretty healthy. Absolutely. So talk about this. Well, what we do with this particular salad, we have the kale, the carrots and then we have the beet spirals and I see the winter squash along with the carrots and what we we're doing I'm sensitive to tomatoes ah. and so how can you make a delicious dish without tomatoes the squashes and the parsnips and all of that can go along with it and so we see all this beautiful array here I see some actually some avocado but I just tell people make your favorite salad mm -hmm. make it very pretty and include it in your dish yeah, that's beautiful absolutely beautiful and then you've got some steamed broccoli and uh, you know we're 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 honoring George W. H. W. Bush, and he hated broccoli. <laughs> I know, Beauty. but your broccoli looks delicious. Well, so. what happens even with my own children and grandchildren? They weren't favorite. You know, broccoli wasn't their favorite. Mm -hmm. and they always wanted to smother it with cheese and everything. But I find out when I prepare it. And I do the same thing with just a little lemon seasoning and garlic and then mm -hmm. spray that olive oil over it and either saute it very quickly. And when you do that, or sometimes I roast it in the oven as uh -huh. well. And it makes, and you steam it, roast it or whatever. Don't boil it because that changes the flavor. Yes, it takes all the vitamins mm -hmm. out of it too, right? And what is this? The crustata. And this one we're going to do today actually with all these wonderful ingredients here. Okay. But it's a very festive dish. You can make it savory. Mm -hmm. You can make it vegetarian, you can do it with the meat, and you can even do it with your sweets, your sweet potatoes okay. or apples. But it's a very simple recipe. Okay, let's talk about how you put that all together here. All right, well, we've got our ingredients here, and, and I'll admit this, Terry, sometimes I'm real busy. I can cut and cube and get them ready, or I can go to my favorite store. <laughs> I knew I loved you. <laughs> <laughs> so they do the work for you, and it's more the cuts are more consistent. So it just depends on yeah, your level looks of really what you want to do. To me. This, this is, how I is buy it. Mine That's too. what I do. I buy it that way. So we do olive oil and butter, and I know this is a little rich, and that's okay because you have to have a little delicious fat in your food. So you warm up your butter <laughs> and your olive oil just a little bit, and once that begins to melt, 
you're gonna, I mean, the mm -hmm. oven is just kind of popping. I was trying to figure out how it's to get it not to do that. It's just the noise this thing makes. It, okay, it yeah, just it likes does to that. talk while we're Okay, and the <laughs> pan is really warm as it should be. Now, you see me doing this, but I'm used to doing it. Don't just lay your hand on there, because that would be a dangerous thing to do. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Okay, but I just checked to see how warm the pan now, is. Now, this is butternut squash this you're This is your butternut that. squash. This one, we're doing the, a vegan one today, except we are going to do a little cheese on top. But you can do it with or without the cheese. Okay. So we have our butternut squash. I and, love. And you know, some people like Brussels sprouts. I you love like it? Brussels sprouts. Okay, some yes. people do, some don't. But so you, they're strong, but they're good. They really are, and they're very good for you. A lot of fiber, a lot of vitamins in those. I'm going to take this up a Go little ahead. bit mm -hmm. to see if that'll help. And uh, we're going to put our onions. I like the red onions. I do too. See, because they're very flavorful. But you can do the shallots. You can do chives, oh, anything too. from the mm -hmm. onion family, and your own special seasonings that you like and that you prefer. And so what we do, we don't want to cook these too long because they have to go in the oven and they're going to cook some more. Okay. But we just want them to kind of just saute gently in the oil and in the butter. Oh, it smells so wonderful. It really does. And you have salt and pepper to taste, mm -hmm. a pinch of salt. We talk about that. That's just to taste the ones that you like. Mm -hmm. And some people like more, some people like less. And you have your salt and your pepper. And once you saute these down, I see my butter is melted. You just mm -hmm. really want to get to release the flavors of that in your oil mm -hmm. and in your butter. Now you have a... a the pie crust, pie crust is here. here. And so once you get all of this kind of blended and mixed, you get it in there. And we've got our almonds today. So nuts, these are optional because some people can't have That's nuts. Awesome. They have nut allergies. So you have your you filling. You can leave that out This if you is your want filling. To, right? It's to mm -hmm. taste. And in the cookbook, we give all of these various options mm -hmm. and what you can do. Now, here's the trick. We've got enough to make two today, but let's just kind of go okay. on with one now. Okay, now this is sauteed. You see it's beginning uh -huh, to Uh-huh, it looks beautiful. The down. color of everything in it Isn't it's it pretty? Gorgeous. It's so festive. Yes. Such a holiday look. So you're just going to spoon that in You feel that, that in inside. Mm -hmm. Oh, Just that's enough beautiful. to fill it. We have enough for two, as I say. Now, why don't you help me scallop okay. this? Come on, we're going to come across and begin to just... All the... Kind of just like that. Just okay, pinch it gotcha. because you want to leave the center slightly exposed. And we're going to scallop it here, okay? And we're going to leave it exposed and pull a little bit back here. Okay. And see how pretty that is? That's Beautiful. the shape of it. And they can, you can make two or three of these at once. You scallop it across. All right. Yeah, I fold it. And we have to get that in the oven. I'm going to put it in the oven, and I'm going okay. to show turn you what it looks one like when it's done. Get that done. All right. Whoa. Ooh, look at this. And we're going to get this one out. This is perfect. Yeah. Now, I know your hands are used to heat, but you're not used to this kind of heat. Okay, I'm going to so let you handle let, that. Let me carry it. All right. <laughs> oh, look at that. That's a work of art. Now, we bake this one with the cheese on it, but you can leave the cheese off mm -hmm. for those who are sensitive and that's to goat the cheese. Cheeses. That you that's put a goat on there, cheese right? there, and we could do that. Now, mm. once it comes out, we're not done. Can you pass that arugula over? Oh, yes, I can. All right, and we're going to get this on a plate. Oh, here, how about this one? Well, this is... It's a little plate, but that's okay. okay. And uh, get it off of there. Okay, don't break, don't break on me. Oh, well, it might. So let's just do it this way. Okay. Now, because if I were at home, I could pick it up a little bit. And uh, here just we go. Oh, yes. It's going to do it like this. This comes out. And I love this part. <laughs> that's awesome. We've got one that... Is, is done All on, done it's so on a plate. See, but look how so you beautiful see, you it is. You see it begins to yes, look like that. Does. That's the look of it. And, you've and got it comes out like this finally. And this is with the cheese or without the cheese. So beautiful. it's just real pretty. I vote with. Okay. You've got wassail and this amazing dessert. These are all in the cookbook. They're in the cookbook and really fast. That's called a trifle in the traditional name for it. But modern ladies now call it a punch bowl cake. So they take their... Pound cake. That's just because they didn't know if it was just triple, they trifle, were sure or trifle. Not. So they call it punch bowl cake, but it's really a trifle. And so you layer it with your favorite cake. 
and Beautiful. your fruit, so you just come on it's up It's all that. so pretty, and it's all in Elvita's book. It's called Gigi's Home for the Holidays Cookbook. It's got a new red cover edition that's being released on December 15th, so you're getting some of the first of it here. Plus, she has a new CD available just in time for Christmas. It's called Tender Moments Alone with God. Both the cookbook and the CD are available wherever books or music are sold. Absolutely. Merry Christmas, Merry my Christmas, friend. everybody. It's great to have you here. Thank you. Still ahead, your questions with some honest answers. Virginia says, I'm a mother of six, but my children are not not living according to God's standards. Will my household be saved at the rapture or left behind? We'll be back with Pat's answer after this. All right. Thank you. And welcome back to the 700 Club. Pastor, Bible teacher, and New York Times bestselling author David Jeremiah is bringing Christmas to Broadway this year. Make the Season Bright is a one-day Christmas show that takes place on December 6th. It will feature the talents of the Gaither Vocal Band, Charles Billingsley, and Sheila Walsh. Plus, there will be a special Christmas message from Dr. Jeremiah. The Turning Point pastor says Christmas is a season dedicated to the gift that keeps on giving, salvation and restoration in Christ. And I'm excited to be a part of a large-scale Broadway event. Actor Chris Pratt celebrated at Disney's annual candlelight ceremony with a reading from the Book of Luke and a personal Christmas message of his own. The way we love our children, and the more we love our children, the more we will understand the capacity for our Father in Heaven to love us. Each and every one of us, a precious creation, and he just marvels in the ways in which we could try to please him. And through this holiday spirit, may we continue to spread peace and goodwill throughout the world. Thank you and Merry Christmas! Amen to that. Remember, you can always get the latest from CBN News by going to our website. It's CBNNews.com. Pat and Terry are back with more today's 700 Club right after this. You know, we haven't perfected smell of vision yet. <laughs> no, but we'd be in big business yeah, if we yeah. did. <laughs> the studio is just full of the delightful aroma from that cooking. It was it, did it taste as good as well, it smelled? Did, I didn't get to taste it, but I have tasted her cooking in the past. The, she is a queen in the kitchen. <laughs> well, she's me. a pro. I mean, it's really yeah. good. We got an audience. I mean, you, 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 I wish you could join <laughs> us and, and, and have these aromas. They're delightful. Okay. Well, Daniel and Lacacia Burrell are a hardworking couple who were struggling to feed their family. Then one day, Lacacia discovered a way to come home with a trunk full of groceries without spending a dime. Akila, let's see what Akila's going to do. Daniel and Lakasha Burrell are dedicated parents who are passionate about ministry. Four years ago, they felt led to move their family to Georgia to help friends plan a church. They said, well, we need children's ministry directors. And we're like, okay, it's been amazing to be able to have our children right there with us during this process. I know that it's touching their lives. Their journey of faith hasn't always been easy. The couple's three-year-old, Daniela, has suffered from a brittle bone disease since she was born. An hour after she was born, the doctors were doing a routine test on her and broke her leg and they had to rush her to Texas Children's Hospital. You had to just handle her a certain way so that she wouldn't break. That's how delicate she was, just like glass. Then she's had her rotting surgeries and then all the infusions every three months. She's still just this happy little girl through it all. Daniel works very long days as a chemical batcher, but when medical bills piled up, finances got tight. Some people say you live paycheck to paycheck, Well, we weren't even making it to the next paycheck. It was very difficult for us to even put gas in our car. We didn't know where our next meal was coming from sometimes. One day, Lakasha was reading a magazine and came across an ad for Warehouse of Hope, a partner of Operation Blessing. I remember one day she just came home with a trunk full of groceries, and it was one of those hard times where, you know, literally it was like we had nothing. Going to Warehouse of Hope relieved a lot 
a lot of pressure off of our family. You fill your whole car up. It's so much, it's like amazing how much they give you. I can't put it into words just how much of a blessing Operation Blessing and Warehouse of Hope has been to our family in this time. And it's gotten better. It's gotten a lot better. Daniel recently took up woodworking. Between the extra income he makes from selling his furniture and the help the family receives from Warehouse of Hope and Operation Blessing, the Burrells are finally making ends meet. I've learned to worship God and to say, God, you are my provider. I'm trusting in you. I would want to say to the people that give to Operation Blessing, thank you from the bottom of my heart. You've made such a huge impact in our life and taken a burden off of our shoulders. Thank you, thank you, thank you. God bless you because you are a part of something bigger than you even know. Well, it's just wonderful to think that somebody who's struggling, that we can reach out and help them. And Operation Blessing helps people all over the world. Millions, as a matter of fact, something in the neighborhood of 300 million people have been helped over the years by Operation Blessing and CBN. So at the end of this year, this might be a time to do something. So we just ask you to consider uh, you know, especially with stock, you know, if you give gifts of stock, you don't have to pay capital gains tax if you have appreciated securities and you get the full uh, deduction for the market value of the stock uh, and you can deduct up to 50% of your income, depending on the rules of the IRS, in some cases it's 30%, but with cash it's 50%. And at the end of the year, that is the time to do it. So. Give us a call, 1-800-700-7000, and um, we, we, we want to help people like Daniel and like Asher. I mean, it's good. Okay. Well, coming up, we've got some of your email questions. Kevin asks, when we witness to someone and they accept Jesus, what should we do next? That's a great question, and Pat's going to answer it after this. Well, it's that time of year to deck the halls with boughs of holly. But have you ever wondered why we decorate with so much greenery at Christmas time? Well, the answer to that question and much, much more is part of our Christmas Traditions DVD. Take a look. It's the darkest time of the year, so you want to be reassured that spring is coming, that the light is coming. So you're going to have a celebration with fires and candles. It is the bleakest time of the year, so you're going to want to be reminded of greenery. So you'll bring indoors plants that retain their winter greenery, like holly or ivy. It's also, food-wise, the most plentiful time of the year. The harvest is in. It's been baked into bread and pies and buns. All the animals have been slaughtered the ones that aren't going to be wintered over. So you've got roasts and sausages. The fish pens have been emptied. The eel pens have been emptied. The grain has been made into beer. The grapes have been made into wine. You've got to eat this stuff because there's no refrigeration. By the late Middle Ages, Christians had adopted a large number of midwinter customs that had once been condemned by the church. And they successfully blended them with biblical images to create the Christmas holiday. Holly became a symbol of Christ's crown of thorns and the blood he shed. And mistletoe, a popular Druid tradition, was used to signal a Christmas truce in battle. Christ is evergreen. Christ is the resurrection, everlasting life. And so you bring in evergreens. You bring in holly and ivy and uh, remind people that uh, in the spring, this is the time of the resurrection and there will be life again. Well, there are so many things we do at the holiday season that are traditions, but we don't always understand the why behind them. That story of the holly and the ivy is just one of the things that you'll learn in this Christmas, the story behind the traditions. It's a DVD that we've prepared just for you. And then Pat has gone into the studio and read the Christmas Carol. This is a Christmas classic. He has way loved playing Scrooge in this. Yeah. <laughs> 
and done a wonderful job of it. But these are our offerings to you this holiday season for a gift of $25 or more. As we want to reach out to people in need, both at home and around the world, we would love to have your support of that. And this is our way of saying thank you. So give us a call right now, 1-800-700-7000, or you can log on to CBN.com and join with us that way. But do something to make a difference for folks this holiday season. Time for some email. Right, Are you let's ready? Take them. Uh, yeah. Okay. This first one comes from Virginia, who says, "I am a mother of six and have been trying to be a good Christian mom in my daily life. My children do believe in Jesus. However, they are not living according to God's standards. I do try to talk to them about being right with God and asking for forgiveness and understanding of how they live a Christian life. I feel they are influenced by their friends. Will my house be, household be saved at the rapture or <laughs> left behind? I don't have a clue as to what's going to happen." your household during the rapture and all seriousness. I, I just don't know. I mean, yeah. you know, but it's impossible to the, the Bible says, bring up a child in the way that he shall go. And when he's old, he won't depart there from. If you've been faithful in, in instilling the principles of the Lord into the lives of your children, when they get old, they won't depart from them. That's what the Bible says. Now, there was a time there was a jailer. You remember the jailer uh, with Paul and, and Silas, they were singing and and uh, the prison opened, and the jailer came down, and uh, the you know the apostle said, you know, you will be saved and your household. Uh, I, I just would like to think that people will be carried through to the end of time, but it depends on how you live and how you've trained them. You invest in those kids, and they will not disappoint you. But you have to spend time with children. And I would say this to any parent. If you don't pay attention to your children, uh, then they're going to pay attention to somebody else. But they, they want to listen to you if you will talk to them and train them. And that's, that's the, the, the message we'd have of that question. All right. Well, and many children wander for a season. You and I are both examples of children who were raised in homes with Christian values. Yeah, and well, I, I went far, far away. So Trust me, I. I sowed more wild oats than you could imagine. He was worse than me, but I'm just yeah. saying. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I'm the chief of sinners. Oh, no, you're the chief of sinners. All right, one of us is. Okay. okay. What else? We'll take turns. Okay, this is Kevin who says, Pat, my question is, when we witness to someone and they accept Jesus, what should we do next? I know seeking a good gospel teaching church would help them. Do I need to help further or just leave the rest to Jesus. I somehow feel responsible to help them grow in the Lord. I, I think you should. You know, uh, Paul said you may have many uh, instructors in the faith, but you only got one father, and I have begot you by my gospel. And I, I think they become your children. You, they, they, I don't, don't want to say you're responsible the rest of your life or anything like that, but I do think that initially starting off, if you can teach somebody, show them the scriptures, uh, we have a, a number of things here that we give out, and I think if if they play that CD or listen to some of these teachings, I mean, it'll help them enormously because it's like a baby. You're going to put the baby out, and what do you do? You've got to give him some nourishment. And I, I think if you lead somebody to the Lord, uh, there is a responsibility to to see that that person is is cared for and especially brought into a fellowship which is caring and nurturing and all those other good things. All right. Okay, this is Joshua who says, Hi, Pat. God gave me a word about what he wants to do in my life. I don't know what to do next. Please, what is your advice since God is silent? Um, well, I, you know, the Bible says wait on the Lord. And uh, the, I think uh, you, you read, I think it was uh, Jeremiah said, I, I, you know, I waited a number of days, and then the word of the Lord came saying, mm -hmm. Um, the Bible says you will hear a voice in your ear saying, when you turn to the right or the left, saying, this is the way, walk ye in it. And the Bible also says, let the peace of God be an umpire in your heart. And so when the peace lifts, you know you've gone the wrong way. So God doesn't have to be talking to you all the time. There's a Bible and there's the Word of God, and He will speak out of that Word. And he will, but if you have the Holy Spirit within you, the Spirit of God will be a constant reminder of what you should do and what you shouldn't do. But don't be in, in always in such a hurry to get something done. God knows who you are, where you live, what your situation is, and He will speak in His good time. So don't be in a hurry. 
All right. Hey, this is Vanessa who says, I've been dating a guy for five months now and things have been off and on. I thought it was normal because people do argue in a relationship. But to my surprise, he's in love with a married woman and they are dating. He just left me like that. From the beginning, I asked him if he was sure that he wanted to be with me and he always said yes. Right now, I'm losing it. I don't know where to go or what to do. Oh. You know that thing about uh, leave off the yep. key, leave, <laughs> yep, get out yep. the back jack and all that stuff. I mean, get yourself free. I mean, you've it's got, uh, so why nice. would you be tied into somebody like that? He's now having an affair with a married woman, and somehow you wonder what to do about it. Tell him goodbye and <laughs> let it go. That's what you do. Yeah. All right, one last. This is Wes who says, as I understand it, epigenetics is different from gene editing. Is that right? Uh, yes, gene editing is actually get into the genetic uh, substance mm -hmm. and, and trying to alter the genetic makeup. Epigenetics is the way you live. The genes stay the same, but the, the uh, activities of the life that you live, what you say, what you do, what you drink, what you smoke, that, that will affect your, your uh, genetic makeup for y your offspring and your children's children. But it's, that's not gene editing, which means getting into the genes and changing them. That, that's, that's what that Chinese guy did, and he's been roundly condemned. Well, today's power minute is from Psalm 19. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows his handiwork. Thank you so much for being with us. Terry and all of us, this is Pat. I'll see you tomorrow. Bye-bye.